Hey guys, Leanna here. It's Tuesday at E3. Here's the things I'm going to be looking at today. Remember, this is a pre-recorded preview. I am in LA. I cannot do these things as I go, as I normally do. First thing in the morning, I'm checking out Rise of the Tomb Raider. And I was very, very, very worried about this game after last year's E3 because they're big... Here's what we got coming up was a somewhat extended scene of Lara Croft in therapy. Now, obviously, I have no issues with therapy. I've written um, g g uh, articles about games and mental illness. My concern is that Lara Croft in therapy was a fundamental rethink of the legacy of the character to this point. Lara Croft uh, has very, very specific motivations, and she is a Byronic heroine, and one of the few female Byronic heroines in any media. Women who fulfill the characteristics of Byronic heroes tend to end up in seductress or femme fatale roles, not as the lead. And so Lara holds a very important role in media, I'll say for lack of a better term, not just gaming, but all adventure stories everywhere. Now, the most recent trailer, the Aim Greater trailer, gives me more hope, and I'm going to show you why. Uh, I'm not going to show you the whole thing, but I want to show you the little bit that gave me hope. First of all, we have action. Thank bloody God. And, uh, yeah, snow. Snow is the new water. I'm concerned. Of, I, I'm, I'm convinced. Snow is the new water. It's the thing people put in their games to say, look what we can do! Discovering, Graphics capability. Oh, talking. the secrets of the world is the only way to live. Boom. Discovering secrets of the world is the only way to live. Key character point in Lara Croft. Important. And that's what we haven't seen. We didn't see it in the reboot. I don't know what that character was. I don't know what they were thinking. But to me, that was a massive step back. Lara was just way too generic in previous games. This trailer gives me hope. So I will be pleased if there is more of this trailer and less of that original trailer of Lara Croft in therapy. I'm fine if she's in therapy for a couple of scenes, but I don't want it to be a defining element of the game. This isn't Grand Theft Auto V, right? Okay, so next up, I will be jumping over to Disney for Disney Infinity. There isn't too much to say about Disney Infinity, just because Disney Infinity 3.0 is the closest thing to a guaranteed moneymaker you get in gaming. It's Star Wars. And as you can see, the designs are based on sort of the, the Clone Wars um, animation design. The thing I'm going to be looking at with all the existing Toys to Life stuff, not just Disney, but Skylanders, and then what do they call it? Lego... I never remember Lego something um, as well, is technically what more are they giving us outside of, you know, it's a toy that you can play with in a game, which means people are going to buy them as figurines, even if they never spend a minute on a console. I want to see the technical improvements and innovations that these companies are offering. So far, to date, they've been exceptionally good. Disney Infinity 2.0 was a big improvement from Disney Infinity 1.0, and Skylanders has um, succeeded in giving us a little bit of nifty extra stuff every single time. So what the important thing to look at with these Toys to Life games is whether or not it justifies the reinvestment in, you know, the portal or the pad or whatever it is, whether it's worth buying the game as opposed to just buying new figures. That is the pass-fail point for Toys to Life games at E3. Up next, I have Ubisoft. And for some odd reason, Ubisoft's website directed me to the French version of the site, I guess because I'm in Canada. This has never happened before. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's saying, welcome to the family. Uh, very good. We don't really need the name. But look, look, Ubisoft is female assassin in you see her sort of on on the um what is this to you that would be your left i believe it's my right or oh, maybe it's your right anyway the lady not wearing the top hat female assassin i think ubisoft is trying to prevent 
the controversy, the, the specific controversy of the last Assassin's Creed game, which was, oh my god, no female playable characters! I liked what they did with Unity artistically in making it a, a cohesive experience, but the bad press made it not worth it. And so I'm going to be looking from Ubisoft, first of all, uh, I don't want to get hung up on the bugs. They know, they know that the bugs have to go away, which means I'm going to be looking for things that are playable because Assassin's Creed Unity wasn't playable right up to the pre-holiday event that Xbox ran last time. And so there better be some hands-on. And there isn't usually, uh, there's usually one or two things that are playable, a lot of other things that are drivable, but I think this is a different year for Ubisoft. I'm hoping there's going to be more hands-on stuff simply because they had that issue last year. On top of that, though, Ubi is a AAA company I look to for experimentation. I will forgive them the little bumps, the little technical issues, provided they're still taking risks creative risks, developmental risks. Uh, I will reward them for deciding that it was time to, you know, redo all the controls and all the movements in the Assassin's Creed franchise. That is gutsy in a yearly franchise. So for Ubi, I will reward them innovation over perfection as long as they continue to innovate. And of course, they've got not just Assassin's Creed, but Rainbow Six Siege and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, what uh, I always forget the name, The Division, The Division, that's what it's called. Hopefully we'll see more from that too, because that's been in development for a while now, publicly. The next thing I'm going to be doing is Sword Coast Legends. I am ridiculously excited about this game just because it's as they say a deep rpg experience make that rude if you want the other interesting thing is the dungeon master mode as you can see on this article the I idea that you can actually have a DD experience meaning you know cooperative role play giving uh people the ability to run their own scenarios the one thing that computer RPGs or video game RPGs have not managed to do that tabletop does is give you that freedom. There's always this frustration, this dissonance, if you will, with computer video games. If your idea of the, you know, morality, for lack of a better term, of the world does not jive with what the developers did. And so this is very, very, very exciting, it potentially. I mean, games in the past have tried to do this, Neverwinter Nights being the most, you know, notable one. And to me, Neverwinter Nights just didn't quite work the way it was promised. But it's been years. It's been years. Technology has improved significantly, so I think it's a good time to try it again. The other thing that's exciting to me is Dan Tudge of Dragon Age Origins. The fact that we have a, a Dragon Age developer going back to the Sword Coast, which is, of course, you know, the loins from which Dragon Age sprang, among other things. I mean, Dragon Age is a pastiche of Game of Thrones and some Terry Pratchett and, and some, uh, you know, Lord of the Rings through uh, the Forgotten Realms. But going back to the Sword Coast is a cool thing. So, you know, um, the other thing is that they're saying that they're going to be bringing the game to the PS4 and the Xbox One, and that means interest goes through the roof on this thing, right? I will be playing on PC. Actually strike that. Maybe not because the challenge this game is going to have is if it's PC, Xbox One, PS4, you're going to have to have the same version of the game to play with your friends. Or will you? The company that manages to break down those barriers, if it can ever happen, I don't know if you know the business models and the legalities allow it, but if somebody could do that, if somebody could allow somebody to play on a PC with somebody on a PS4 or an Xbox One, that would be very interesting to me because the big problem I have is that, yeah, a lot of people play the same games as me, but they don't play them on the same format, the same platform as me. Most people play on console. I'm playing on PC or I'll get a review copy on console. So my PC, uh, playing friends, you know, they don't, um, they can't play with me. That fragmentation is an issue. 
So, you know, maybe the Windows 10 thing, maybe we're going to see some Xbox One PC crossplay. I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll see. The last official appointment I have that day is Sierra's King's Quest. And I am ridiculously excited, ridiculously excited for this game. The original King's Quest game that I played back on, I'm totally dating myself here, a Tandy 1000, a DOS prompt Tandy 1000 with a green monochrome screen. That was my first experience with King's Quest. And what a life defining experience. King's Quest is one of the games I credit for my obsessive love of video games. And I think part of what made it work was it was the first game I'd played with a defined protagonist and Sir Graham was an everyman. He wasn't a big muscle guy. He was a noodly armed, you know, sort of Robin Hood type looking dude, but he had skinny arms and legs and he didn't really fight his way through things. He, he thought his way through things. He solved puzzles and he was clever and he eventually became king of, I believe it's Daventry that it's called. It's amazing how these things embed in your name, in your brain. And, um, the write up on this game makes me very, very excited that they understand what made King's Quest work back in the day. You know, old and gray King Graham, the hero made legend in the original King's Quest games, shares the extraordinary stories of his youth with his curious granddaughter, Gwendolyn, taking players back to the feats that shaped a kingdom. Um, what, um... I like about this is it's an homage to so many things in one sentence, right? One sentence. You've got the, the fact that there are, are multiple generations of the King's Quest games that already exist. Um, and the fact that, you know, Roberta Williams took the big step back in the day of following up King Graham with female playable characters back in the day, like back in the 80s and 90s. But the other thing that's interesting as well is the original King's Quest was about Sir Graham coming in and speaking to the aging king of the realm and completing, you know, feats of daring and quest for the king who is old and gray. So there's a ton of homage possibilities. Um, but they also, you know, here we are, episodic saga. So I guess it's going to be like a telltale thing that honors the core characters and familiar storylines of King Graham's early adventures, setting up new chapters tied to, but independent of the series that helped define Sierra and the adventure genre. It, and then they have the charm, humor, puzzles, exploration, and sense of wonder. Bam, they've got it all. The Odd Gentlemen understand this franchise. And I am just so thrilled to see what they've come up with. And then after that, I have a uh, behind uh, an after hours Xbox thing where I'm going to try to get my hands on Halo. Halo is the one title I tried and failed to get booked. It is crazy in demand. I think it is insane that there's limited quantities of a game that huge. But, you know, that's the E3 cruelty for you. Um, but this is what I've got set up for Tuesday. I am stoked. I am super excited. So you guys can, can expect to see more stuff on these games and more coming up in my E3 2015 coverage.